Section 5, Chapter 7, Solving Rational Equations. We will look to solve rational equations containing constant denominators, so real numbers, as well as variable denominators, such as variables, variable expressions, i.e. polynomials. In order to solve a rational equation, the method that we will use is to first by inspecting all of the factors that make up the denominators of the e expressions within our equation we will determine the lcd by multiplying each side of our equation by the lcd this is our multiplication property of equality that says as long as we multiply on each side of the equation we are balancing the equation what does this do for us by determining the lcd and multiplying each side of the equation by the LCD, this will completely eliminate the denominators in our equation. Thus, our rational equation will become a much more approachable, solvable equation, some sort of polynomial equation, whether that be a linear equation, a quadratic equation, a cubic equation, etc. By multiplying each side by the LCD, we will have an equivalent equation that is much easier to solve. So to solve rational equations with constant denominators, denominators, in other words, denominators that are real numbers, reminder that a rational equation is an equation containing one or more rational expressions. Everything we've looked at thus far are just simply expressions, adding and subtracting rational expressions, multiplying and dividing, rational expressions, and simplifying rational expressions. Here, when we take that idea of working with rational expressions and have those in an equation, how will we solve an equation involving rational expressions? Well, here, the, this equation involving rational expressions is called a rational equation. And to solve a rational equation, our objective here is to first determine the least common denominator of the rational expressions in the rational equation. Finding the LCD and multiplying each side of the equation by the LCD will rid us of the denominators, leaving us with a much easier equation to solve. For example, solve the rational equation 3 fifths equals x over 2 plus 1. So here we do have a rational equation. We notice there is an equality sign. What is equal here? The x over 2 plus 1. When you take a number x, whatever x is, when you take x and divide it by 2 and add 1 to that result, this equals the fraction 3 fifths. So what number could that be? We could sit here and just try to start guessing what x could be. But x could potentially be a fraction or a decimal or an irrational number. So how could we solve for x? Well, let's do what it says below. Determine the LCD of the rational expressions. Here we have two rational expressions, 3 fifths and x over 2. The denominators are 5 and 2. What is the LCD of 5 and 2? In other words, what is the smallest number that both 5 and 2 can divide into? Well, we can look at the LC or find the LCD by looking at the factors that make up 5 and 2. 5 is in fact prime. 2 is also prime. So the factors that make up 5 and 2 are 5 and 2. Therefore, the LCD must consist of the factors of 5 and 2. The factors of 5 and 2 together, 5 times 2 gives us 10. So the least common denominator of these fractions is 10. So we will begin by multiplying each side of the equation by 10. And that makes sense, right? The smallest number that both 5 and 2 can divide into is 10. 10 divided by 5 is 2. Likewise, 10 divided by 2 is 5. To find the LCD for this example, all we had to do was multiply together our denominators of 5 and 2. So we get an LCD of 10, multiplying each side of our equation by 10. Well, on the left-hand side, the fraction 3 fifths is being multiplied by 10. If you have 10 times 3 fifths, this is the same as adding 3 fifths 10 times. Well, in doing that, it's the same as multiplying the 10 to the numerator of 3. 10 multiply 3 fifths 
Again, 10 is understood as the fraction 10 over 1. So 10 multiply 3 fifths. We know from our last, our section 2, when you multiply fractions, 10 multiply 3 fifths, you multiply straight across. So where does the 10 get multiplied to? It's a 3. And so 10 multiplied 3 fifths is 30 fifths. 30 fifths, if you have 30 fifths, 30 divided by 5 is 6. And now on the right hand side, the 10 is going to multiply the binomial expression x divided by 2 plus 1. It is a binomial, right? Our first term is x over 2. Our second term is 1. So the 10 is going to multiply the x over 2. The 10 will also distribute to the positive 1. So 10 distributed to x over 2. Well, what happens here? The 10 multiplies the x. And then we have that over 2. 10x over 2. Well, 10 divided by 2 is 5. 10 divided by 2 is 5. So we, here we have 5x. Plus 10 times 1, which is plus 10. So when multiplying the right-hand side of our equation by the LCD of 10, distributing the 10 to x over 2 plus 1, we get 5x plus 10. Like we said here, 10 multiply 3 fifths. If you have 3 fifths 10 times, 3 times 10 is 30. 30 fifths is 6. So notice that by multiplying each side of the equation by the LCD, we completely eliminate our denominators. We no longer have a denominator of 5 or a denominator of 2. We actually have no denominators at all. We now have the equation 6 equals 5x plus 10. This is a linear equation. The variable x is understood to have an exponent of 1. Therefore, this is a first degree polynomial equation, which is a linear equation. To solve a linear equation, we isolate the variable x. We want to get it by itself on one side of the equation. Now, for this equation, there are three terms. There is a 6, a 5x, and a 10. Of those three terms, only one of the terms has the variable x. The other two terms, 6 and 10, are constant numbers. They're, numbers that have, they're terms that have no variables. Therefore, they are re referred to as constants. We need to combine the constants because they are like terms. However, they are on opposite sides of the equation sign. So the 6 and 10, we cannot combine to give us 16. We have to combine by doing the opposite of the sign here. This x is being multiplied by 5, and then we're adding 10. Let's get rid of that by subtracting 10 on each side of the equation. 6 minus 10 is negative 4. On the right-hand side, 5x plus 10 minus 10 is simply 5x. So our variable x multiply 5 is negative 4. To get x by itself, we divide by 5 on each side. Negative 4 divided by 5 is the fraction negative 4 fifths. So our solution for x here is negative 4 fifths. Now how can we confirm that? Well, let's take negative 4 fifths and plug it in for x. Taking our solution of negative 4 fifths from, uh, for the original equation. We want to know, does the fraction 3 fifths, does this actually equal... x over 2, where x is negative 4 fifths, so negative 4 fifths divided by 2 plus 1. So how can we confirm that these two numbers are exactly the same? And we are checking to see if this solution is actually correct. Well, negative 4 fifths divided by 2, if you multiply a fraction by a whole number, the whole number multiplies in the numerator. However, if you take a fraction and divide it by a whole number, when you divide by the 2, the 2 doesn't go into the numerator, it actually goes into the denominator. Negative 4 fifths becomes negative 4 tenths, and here's why. If you're dividing by 2, let's write 2 as a fraction, 2 over 1. To divide by a fraction, according to section 2, to divide by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of the fraction. Negative 4 fifths divided by 2 is the same thing as negative 4 fifths multiply a half. Dividing something by 2 is cutting it in half. 
So what is one half of negative four fifths? That is the multiplication of the fractions. Multiplying straight across, we get a fraction negative four tenths. And simplifying this down because four is understood to be the product of two and two, we see here that in the numerator, there is a factor of two as well as in the denominator. So what do we see this actually reduces down to? Not negative four tenths, but two times one, and then five in the denominator. As we see there, four divided by two is two, 10 divided by two is five, negative two fifths. So on this side right here, this becomes negative two fifths. So on the left hand, three fifths. We still wanna know, does this equal x over two plus one when x is negative four fifths? Negative four fifths divided by two is negative two fifths. But now we just wanna know, if we add negative two fifths and one, does this actually equal three fifths? Well, again, how do we add fractions? They have to have the same denominator. One is understood as the fraction one over one. So how can we add these two fractions? Got to have a same denominator. The LCD of five and one, five times one is five. By multiplying this fraction of one over one with a five over five, we now have in the numerator five and in the denominator five. Of course, that makes sense, right? Because five fifths, five divided by five is one. And now to add negative two fifths to five fifths, because the denominators are the same, we can combine them over the common denominator and now combine the numerators, negative two plus five. What is negative two plus five over five? Well, negative two plus five is three over the common denominator of five. So we just confirmed here that negative four fifths Is in fact the correct solution. The previous work were the steps that we apply to show that x is the solution. Here is the confirmation by plugging it back into the equation, substituting it in, performing the arithmetic to show that the left hand side three fifths and the right hand side are in agreement. They're the same exact value for when x equals negative four fifths, confirming that is in fact the correct solution. Solve the following equations. Here for number eight, we have the fraction a over two equal to the fraction a plus two over three. Now look at the study tip on the side. Here before, we have discussed cross multiplication in previous classes, in previous courses, we've used cross multiplication as a way to solve proportions. Proportions are fractions equal to fractions. Notice for numbers 10 and 16, we have more than two fractions. We have more than two rational expressions. Cross multiplication will not work for problems such as 10 and 16. However, for number eight, we have a fraction equal to a fraction. In order to solve a rational equation that is defined to be a proportion, again, a proportion is a fraction. Say, for example, we have some fraction A over B equal to some fraction C over D. Our properties of proportions tell us that if the fraction equals the fraction, then we have that by cross multiplication, the product of A and D that product will be exactly the same as B and C. The numerator of one fraction and the denominator of the other fraction, when multiplied, will equal the denominator of the first fraction multiplied to the numerator of the second fraction. That proportion will give us this result. This result will help us solve for the variable within our rational equation. Let's try this for number eight. Number eight, we have a over two. So we have a fraction equal to a fraction a plus two over three. Go to the full view. Because we have a fraction equal to a fraction, our rules of cross multiplication, or rather our rules of proportions, say that we can use the method of cross multiplication. Cross multiplying fraction equal to a fraction 
this this a is going to multiply this three. We will express it as the product three times a. This will equal the product the product of two and a plus two. So the two is going to multiply the binomial a plus two. Notice that by using cross multiplication, we get rid of our denominators and we have now a new equation that is much easier to solve that is linear. Now to solve an equation that is linear, we need to get the variable a by itself. On the right hand side, we have parentheses. So to get rid of the parentheses, we will first consider distributing the two to a plus two. We do that using multiplication and get two a plus four. And this of course equals the three a on the left. We have two terms with the variable a and one term that is a constant. The 3a is larger than the 2a. So to combine these, I'm, I'm going to consider, and also because the constant is on the right side, I'm going to consider taking this 2a and moving it over here, combining these like terms. To move it across the equality sign, we have to use our properties of equality. If I added 2a, I would get 4a over here. That's not going to help me isolate the variable. I must subtract 2a from both sides to balance out the equation. Subtracting 2a over here will eliminate that term, leaving me with 4. On the left-hand side, however, I'm going to subtract 2a. 3a minus 2a is 1a, which we write as a. We get our solution that a is equal to 4. Now, is that true? What if we plug it back into a? Substitute 4 in for a. On the left-hand side, we get 4 over 2. On the right-hand side, we want to know, are those numbers the same? What is the fraction 4 over 2? That simplifies down, right? 4 halves is 2. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 over 3, 6 thirds, or 6 divided by 3 is also 2. That is a true statement that two equals two. This confirms that our solution of four is in fact the correct solution. Four is our solution to the rational equation. <clears throat> now keep in mind that what we're gonna do for the rest of the examples, we actually wanna find the LCD because for examples like 10 and 16, as well as our first example at the top, we have more than, uh, we have more than two rational expressions. Now that plus one at the top, we can consider that the fraction one over one. That's what we mean. There's more than two terms. For number eight, there's only two terms, the a over two and the a plus two over three. It's a fraction equal to a fraction. Therefore, we can use cross multiplication as we, as we saw. <clears throat> well, for number eight, what is our LCD? We have denominators two and three. What is the smallest number that both two and three will divide into? Well, it's six, right? That's the smallest multiple that two and three share. There are an infinite number of multiples, 12, right? 12 can be divided by two and three. 18, 24, 30, et cetera. Basically any multiple of six is a common multiple of two and three, but the least common multiple and therefore the least common denominator is six. By multiplying the left-hand side, a over two by six, you get three a. By multiplying the right-hand side, a plus two over three by six, multiplying by six and dividing by three results in a two, thus the a plus two is being multiplied by the two, and you get the same result. So let's move on to number 10. Number 10, in order to solve the rational equation for number 10, first determine the LCD for the denominators. In other words, what is the smallest such number? That can be divided by four and six. All right, we have three denominators. We have a four, a four, and a six. So with the denominators of four and six, the LCD, the smallest such number, well, you can always find a common multiple by multiplying the denominators together. Four times six is 24. 24 is a multiple. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24. That's what's defined to be a multiple. Six, 12, 18, 24 right? Six, four times or four, six times. But is that the least common multiple? Is there potentially a number that is smaller than 24 
that both four and six can divide into, right? When we counted up the fours and the sixes just then, we actually said a number before the 24 that was both common. And that's 12. 4, 8, 12. So 4 times 3, 6, 12. 6 times 2. 12 is the smallest number. Thus, 12 is our LCD for number 10. How could we find 12 if we didn't count that, right? To find the LCD, list out the multiples of 4 and 6. There's an infinite number of multiples for 4 and 6. 24 is, in fact, a common multiple of 4 and 6. However, 12 is the least of these common multiples. Therefore, it's the LCM. Therefore, it's the LCD. Multiplying 12 to each side. If we didn't use that, think about the factors that make up 4 and 6. All right, four is two times two, six is two times three. The LCD will consist of the factors that make up our denominators four and six. There are two factors of two. All right, two squared, two times two is just two squared. The LCD will consist of the factors raised to the largest exponent. The, the factor of two, although there is a factor of two here, there are two factors up here. In other words, both of these factors of 2 must be in our LCD for this number to divide into it. If I only just put a 2 over here, the 4 cannot divide into a 2. But the 4 can divide into 2 times 2 because 2 times 2 is 4. So the LCD must contain both factors of 2. What about this number 6 here? The 6 contains factors 2 times 3, therefore the LCD must contain factors 2 times 3 in order for it to be divisible by 6. Well, this factor of 2 is already up here, so we must include this factor of 3. Thus, the LCD of 4 and 6 is 2 times 2 times 3, which is 12. So the LCD, we can either look at the list of multiples for 4 and 6 and determine which is the smallest that agrees in both of the lists. Or you look at the factors, the prime factors that make up your denominators and collect the factors for your LCD, multiply them together, and that result <clears throat> is in fact your LCD. <clears throat> so let's use that. Let's use 12. On the left-hand side for number 10, It'll multiply x over 4 minus x over 6. On the right-hand side, the 12 will multiply 1 fourth. The objective of finding the LCD is now to multiply the LCD on each side of the equation and get rid of your denominators. Think of it like this. What's 12 divided by 4? It's 3. So the 3 is going to multiply this x here. What's 12 divided by 6? It's 2. So the 2 is going to multiply this negative x. How do we know that's going to happen? Again, consider it. You distribute this 12. 12 is a fraction 12 over 1. So multiplying the fraction 12 over 1 to x over 4, you get 12x over 4. 12x over 4 simplifies to 3x. Minus 12 times x divided by 6. 12 times x divided by 6 is 12 divided by 6 times x, which is 2x. So you get 3x minus 2x. On the right-hand side, what's 1 fourth of 12? What's a quarter of 12? 3, 6, 9, 12. Oh, so 4 equal parts of 12 would be 3. So 12 times a fourth. Another way to say that, 12 times 1 is 12 divided by 4 is 3. So 3x minus 2x is 3. Simplifying the left-hand side into 1x, right? 3 minus 2 is 1. Therefore, x equals the solution of 3. Substitute 3 back into your equation and check to make sure your solution is correct. We can try that there. If, three, if we think 3 is our solution,
So this is our original equation, just to make sure. Let's chug it. Let's plug in three for f. We want to know is this true? Three fourths subtract three sixths. Does this equal one fourth? Common denominator. We said the LCD was twelve. How do we go from three fourths to some number over twelve? Four times three is twelve. Therefore, multiplying a three in the numerator as well, we get that the fraction nine twelfths is equivalent to three fourths. Now, what about three over six? Notice that three is exactly half of six. What's half of twelve? Well, six. Three over six is the fraction one half. Well, so is six out of twelve. And how do we know that? Well, to go from six to twelve. We multiply by 2, but we must also do so in the numerator. 3 times 2, which is 6. 6 times 2, which is 12. Now, what about 1 fourth? How do we go from 1 fourth to some number out of 12? To go from 4 to 12, 4, 8, 12. Multiply by 3. In the numerator, 1 times 3 is 3. Of course, we see that the equivalence, 3 out of 12 is equivalent to 1 out of 4. So is this true here? Does 9 twelfths minus 6 twelfths equal 3 twelfths? We see that is true with a common denominator of 12. We subtract the numerators, 9 minus 6. To get the fraction 3 twelfths. This confirms that our solution is, in fact, 3. Because we just confirmed that. Plug in 3 and show that the left side is the same as the right side. And that confirms that your solution is, in fact, the right solution. X does equal 3. Number 16, we have a rational equation. The difference of our rational expressions equals a rational expression. X squared over 2 subtract 3X over 5 equals negative 1 tenth. To solve a rational equation, we first want to determine the LCD of our rational expressions. For the, the denominators 2, 5, and 10, the LCD would be the number that each of these numbers can divide into. It's the smallest such number. That would be 10, right? 10 can be divided by 2 five times. 10 can be divided by 5 two times. And 10 can be divided by 10 once. There are an infinite number of common multiples, such as 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, etc. Basically, just count by tens, and you will find a common multiple of 2, 5, and 10. However, 10 is the least of these. So let's use the LCD to multiply each side of the equation by 10. The entire left-hand side of the equation multiplied by 10, the entire right side multiplied by 10. Of course, what are we going to say here? Treat the number 10 as a fraction. You don't have to if you already know exactly where this is going. Multiplying the 10 to x squared over 2, 10x squared divided by 2, 10 divided by 2 is 5. So distributing a 10 to x squared over 2, divide the 2 into the 10. That's what that's where we're going to get rid of that fraction. 10 divided by 2 is 5, leaving us with 5x squared. No longer are we going to multiply by 10 and divide by 2 with this x squared. Multiplying by 10 and dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 5. Minus. Distributing the 10 to the 3x over 5. Once again, what's happening to this 3x here? This 3x is being divided by 5 and multiplied by 10. To be multiplied by 10 and divided by 5, 10 divided by 5 is 2. So that 3x in the numerator being multiplied by 10 and divided by 5 is really just being multiplied by 2. On the right-hand side, a fraction that's negative multiplied to a fraction that's positive. That'll give us a negative fraction. What is that negative fraction? In the numerator, 1 times 10. In the denominator, 10 times 1. So we have some simplification in some areas. 5 times x squared stays the same. Minus. 
2 times 3 times x is 6 times x. Now what about the right hand side? We have a fraction, negative 10 tenths or 10 divided by 10, which is negative 1. What have we got going on here? 5x squared minus 6x equals negative 1. We have three terms. We have the x squared term, we have the x term, and we have a constant. What does this look like here? We started with a rational equation. We now have an equation involving terms. So we have a polynomial equation. But what type of polynomial equation do we have? Largest exponent is 2. Thus, this is a quadratic equation. To solve a quadratic equation by factoring, and later on we'll talk about the quadratic formula, to solve a quadratic equation by factoring or by the quadratic formula, you must set the equation equal to zero. This equation equals negative one. So we don't want negative one. We want that number that's one larger than negative one, which is zero. So to get zero, we add one to the negative one. But to add one on the right-hand side, we must add one now on the left-hand side. So you see here that negative one plus one is zero. We get zero on the right-hand side like we desire. But what happens on the left-hand side? Where do we add this one? Right? None of these three terms here are like terms. An x squared term, an x term, and a constant are unlike. So we leave them as three terms. So what do we have? 5x squared minus 6x plus 1 equals 0. This is what's defined to be a quadratic equation. AX squared plus BX plus C equals 0. Defines a quadratic equation where A, the coefficient of X squared, is 5. B is negative 6. And C is positive 1. All right. Recall that solving a quadratic equation means to isolate the equation equal to zero. So first things first, proper largest exponent followed by the next largest followed by the constant, and it's equal to zero. So we have the general form set up. It's standard, it's proper, this is what we need. Now we will solve by factoring the trinomial. We are focusing on just the left-hand side, 5x squared minus 6x plus 1, and we will solve by factoring. Let's use our AC method of factoring. A is 5, C is 1, 5 times 1 is 5. Our next objective here is to find two numbers, integers, that multiply to give us 5, that will also add to give us negative 6. Now they must be negative if they multiply to give us positive, if they add to give us negative. Negative 1, negative 5. Multiply to give us 5, add to give us negative 6. We will use these two numbers as coefficients to break apart the middle term minus 6x. So here we have a minus 1x and a minus 5x that we will use to write as the minus 6x. Notice minus 5x minus x is minus 6x. We're back to where we started. What this allows us to do is factor by grouping. Group together the first two terms. Group together the last two terms. First two terms, greatest common factor. Well, I see a 5 and an x in both of these. I'm going to factor out the 5x. What do I leave behind when I factor out a 5x from 5x squared? 5x factored out of our first two terms leaves behind x minus 1. We confirm this by distributing. 5 times x times x is 5x squared minus 5x times 1, which is 5x. Good to go there. Now notice here, whatever we factor out of these two terms, we're going to leave behind a binomial. That binomial must match this x minus 1. We'll notice here the two terms, minus x plus 1, these are opposite terms of x minus 1. So what should we factor out in order for our remainder our leftover factor to look exactly like x minus 1. Factor out a negative 1. 
from these two terms here, if you factor out a negative 1, this negative x becomes positive x. This positive 1 becomes negative 1. You change the signs. Negative 1 times x is negative x. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So we've confirmed that. We have a common binomial factor of x minus 1. Factor and introduce parentheses to determine what you leave behind. 5x minus 1. The product of these two binomial factors, x minus 1 multiply 5x minus 1, this results in a 0. According to section 5 of chapter 6, the zero factor property states that when you multiply two or more numbers together and this results in a zero, then one of those numbers, maybe both, must be zero. You can't multiply numbers together and get zero if one of those two numbers aren't zero. So what we do here is we set each factor equal to zero and solve. Setting x minus one equal to zero. Adding one to each side, we get a solution of x equals one. Setting 5x minus 1 equal to 0 and solving. x is being multiplied by 5 and we're subtracting 1. So let's reverse that, those steps and let's start by adding 1. We get that 5 times x equals 1 to get x by itself. Divide off the 5. We get a second solution that x equals 1 fifth. So go back to that PowerPoint quickly. For number 16, note that for this rational equation, we actually obtain two solutions. So we have a solution set here, a set of numbers, one-fifth and one. This is a solution set because it's a set of numbers that represents a solution. Why is it that you think that we obtain two solutions for this rational equation for number 16? Well, look at the variable x. There's an x that's being squared. Recall that the degree of the exponent, that, that exponent's, um, the degree of the variable, the largest such exponent, in this case a 2, often determines how many uh, possible solutions we may have. For numbers 8 and 10, the variables a and x are to the first power. Thus, we only ended up with one solution. Now, for number 16, our variable x, x squared over 2, just because that one variable there has an x squared, that would indicate that there are potentially two solutions. It's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed to have any solution to an equation. It's possible that an equation with no solution, remember, is called a contradiction. Uh, those equations do occur. But if this rational equation has a solution, it turns out there will either be one solution, two solutions, or an infinite number of solutions. That is because the largest exponent is 2. So if our largest exponent is 3, there may be three solutions. But for number 16, the x squared would give us a hint that there sh should be more than likely two solutions. And to always confirm if they are the right solutions, substitute them back into your equation one at a time and confirm that the left-hand side simplifies down to that number at, of the right-hand side, negative one-tenth. But for here, our two solutions, one-fifth and one. Looking at number 19, we have the difference of two rational expressions equals two-thirds. To solve the rational equation, determine the LCD. For the denominators 5, 9, and 3, we can determine the LCD by our factorization of denominators. Five is a prime number. We can only write this as the product of five times one. Three is also prime. Therefore, we can only write this as the product of factors three and one. Now, nine is a perfect square. 3 times 3. So the prime factorization for each of the three denominators is listed. Now to use the prime factors to determine the LCD, the factor of 5 must be in the LCD. The factor of 1 isn't going to help us to multiply by 1 isn't going to change anything. Both of these factors of 3 must be in the LCD. This factor of 3 here is already being represented in the LCD. This factor of 1 doesn't help our cause. So the LCD is the product of factors 5, 3, and 3. 5 times 3 is 15, times 3 is 45. In other words, 45 is the smallest such number. That can be divided by 5 
9, and 3. And that would make sense too because remember that 5 can only divide into numbers that end in a 0 or a 5. Well, the smallest such number that can be divided by 9 that ends in a 0 is 90. 90 is a common factor, or excuse me, excuse me, common multiple. Sorry about that. 90 is a common multiple, but the least common multiple, the smallest such number, is 45. 5 divides 45 9 times. 9 divides 45 5 times. 3 will divide into 45 15 times. Smallest such number. So let's multiply it on each side of our equation for number 19. h plus 2 over 5. You already see where this is going here. Go ahead and encourage you to jump ahead on this. Pause the video while I write this down. So the, the entire left-hand side, and notice basically what's happening here is every single term, and in this case for number 19, we have three terms because we have three fractions. The three fractions, all three of them are being multiplied by the LCD of 45. The objective here is to use the LCD to get rid of our denominators, and that's exactly what's going to happen. On the left-hand side, we'll go to the full view. 45 distributed to our first fraction. Now, notice what happens. We have a factor of 45, and we're also dividing by 5. If you multiply by 45 and divide by 5, that's the same thing as multiplying by 9. Why is that the case? 45 divided by 5 is 9. So we leave a factor of 9 and the h plus 2. Minus. Same thing here. Multiply by 45 and divide by 9 to multiply to, to let's, let's use the die. I am multiplying h minus 1. h minus 1 is being multiplied by 45, but then it's being divided by 9. So what's happening to this h minus 1 here? This h minus 1 is really being multiplied by the fraction 45 over 9, which we simplify down to 5. So the h minus 1 is being multiplied by 5. 45 divided by 9 is 5. That 5 is now multiplying to h minus 1. Right hand side. 2 thirds times 45. In other words, what is 2 thirds of 45? 15, 30, 45. So notice here that 15, 30, 45, 15, 30 should be 30. And why is that the case? 45 divided by 3, 45 divided by 3 is 15, 15 times 2 is 30. In other words, 2 thirds of 45 is 30. 45 times 2 is 90, divided by 3 is 30. Another way to look at it. You can look at it both ways, right? 45 times 2 is 90, divided by 3 is 30. 45 divided by 3 is 15, times 2 is 30. That's that nice relationship between multiplication and division. So what do we have here? We have a much nicer equation now to solve, and this is a linear equation. 9 multiply the h plus 2, subtract 5 multiply the h minus 1 is 30. Now what do we know for the variable h? That is what we we're trying to solve for. To do so, we need to get rid of those pesky parentheses. We do so by distributing. Distribute the 9. Minus 5 will distribute to the h, minus 5h. Minus 5 will distribute to minus 1, negative 5 times negative 1. And this equals 30. So on the left-hand side, we have four terms. But these terms here are like, some of them are at least. How many h's do I have? Well, I have 9 h's, but I'm going to take away 5 h's. 9 minus 5 is 4. And I'm now still on the left-hand side, I have a positive 18, I have a positive 5. Well, how many positives do I have? Combine the positive 18 and positive 5. Simplifying the left-hand side, 4H plus 
23 equals 30. So to solve for the variable h here, this is the only term with our variable. These are constants. We need to get them together. Moving the 23 over using subtraction, we're balancing the equation. 4 times h equals 30 minus 23, which is 7. I multiply h by 4 to get 7, so what is the number h here? Dividing by 4, we get that h is 7 fourths. Because the numerator is larger than the denominator, 7 fourths is a number larger than 1. 7 divided by 4 is 1 and 3 fourths, 1.75. 1 and 3 quarters. H is 7 fourths. Notice the similarities between exercise 22 and exercise 19. Right, identical in the way that they are set up. The difference of two fractions equals a fraction. To solve this rational equation containing rational expressions, first determine the LCD of your three denominators, 10, 5, and 5. The smallest such number that 5 and 10 can divide into is 10. 10 is the LCD. 10 divided by 10 is 1. 10 divided by 5 is 2. Any number ending in a 0 or 5 that's, that is 10 or larger, 10, 15, or excuse me, any number uh, ending in a 0, I apologize, 10, 20, 30, 40, etc., is a multiple of 5 and 10, but the least common multiple and thus the least common denominator of 5 and 10 is 10. So take a moment to pause the video here and multiply each side of the equation. Thus, multiply all three fractions by the LCD of 10, thus eliminating your denominators and having an equation much simpler to solve. Now that we are going to multiply the left-hand side by 10, we will distribute to both. Just the, the distri distribution just guarantees that you are going to take this outside number and multiply it to every single term on the left-hand side here. All right, in what's in parentheses, which is the entire left-hand side. 10 multiply the numerator divided by 10. Well, 10 divided by 10 is 1. 1 multiply 2x minus 7 is simply 2x minus 7. So the product of 10 and division of 10 cancels out, leaving you with 2x minus 7. Minus. Now in this case here, 10 distributed to the 3x plus 1 over 5, 10 multiply the numerator divided by 5. 10 divided by 5 is 2. So we will take the factor of 2 and multiply it to our numerator 3x plus 1. So we have our left-hand side. Now on our right-hand side, same scenario. 10 divided by 5 is 2. So the 2 will multiply the 6 minus x. 6 minus x. To divide by 5 and multiply by 10 is the same as multiplying by 2. Take $100, divide it by 5 to get 20, multiply it by 10 to get 200. Well, if you start with 100 and you go to 200, that's the same as multiplying by 2. Now we simplify. Let's first look at it and note that all the variable x's are raised to the first power. So this will be a linear equation. We start by distributing and getting rid of parentheses. 2x minus 7 stays the same for now. Minus 2, multiply 3x. Minus 2, a negative 2, multiply positive 1. So we have four terms there that we'll look to simplify down. However, on the right-hand side, 2 times 6, 2 times negative x. Two terms on the right hand side. Before we start affecting them, let's look at the left hand side and note that with the four terms, these two are like, these two are like. The variable terms, how many x's do we have? I have two x's, but I'm going to take away six. Two minus six is negative four. So we have negative four x. constant numbers, negative 7 combined with negative 2. So those four terms combine down to the two terms, negative 4x minus 9. This equals 
12 minus 2 megs. So what can we do here? Variable term here, variable term here, we need to get them together. Constant term here, constant term here, we need to bring them together. We can move this here and thus move this here, or we can move this here and thus move this here. We add 4x on the left hand side, let's add 4x on the right hand side. Any number in its opposite, positive 4x, negative 4x, they'll go away. Because we move the variable to the right, let's move the constant to the left. 12 is positive, so we'll subtract 12 on each side of the equation. 12 minus 12 is 0. So what do we have over here? Combining negative 9 and negative 12, that's negative 21 on the left hand side. On the right hand side, how many x's do we have? Negative 2 and positive 4. Well, positive 4 is larger, right? 4 minus 2 is 2, so that's 2x. Let's think about that there. x multiply 2, or 2 multiply x is negative 21. So what's x? Divide each side by 2. x is equal to the fraction negative 21 halves. So x is a negative fraction, x is negative 21 halves.